swarm thing, the natural nest, looks like this. Ironically, you also had a picture. Mine's a spruce, yours was a pine. Uh, these bees hang in here. This is the animal. This is the thing you all sat here for the last two days to study and learn more about. It looks like this if you denude it of everything else that usually surrounds it. It looks just exactly like that. These biological systems are all there, defense, reproduction, olfaction, vision, and they gotta have some place to call home. They just don't do well hanging outside. And they gotta have a comb structure, which to them is surprisingly disposable. While we like to think you can use comb ad infinitum, we used to do that when at least we didn't have these pesticides that we had to worry about. So they go out there and they find a place to live, and there is no standard place out there. All natural cavities are not perfect. So, some colony mortality is going to always happen. Here's my beehive. It cast a swarm there, it cast a swarm across the street, it cast a swarm here, got one down by the flag down there, and it's got this one. Winter comes, it's a bad one. This dies, that dies, one by the flag died, the parent colony died, but two across the street lived. So the gene pool of that colony survived. So those two across the street then take on the role that this colony had taken on, and then next winter they're gonna be up. They gotta swarm, 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 and do that whole thing. So bees are not investing in a single unit. They're investing in a gene pool survival structure so that that particular brand name, family name, survives. So some mortality out in the wild is perfectly normal. Think about it. If your goal is to live for the next 90 years and you're gonna do it in a rotted, falling apart tree, you got kind of a short-term view of immortality. So just by the very fact that bees live under these conditions indicates they better have an alternative plan because this tree is not gonna be there forever. I wanna to refer to this in a minute about what's down here. But I'm not going to come back to the slide, so hold that thought. So they do this occasionally. They'll nest outside. You can get away with this in Central and South America. I don't know where it begins to fade away. You can't really get away with this long term in Alabama. You'll have a longer death, but you're going to die if you hang outside. So I kind of am curious about what's actually the procedure that just putting a box around them makes everything all better. Has it got to be moisture? So if it just keeps the rain off of you, or the cold snow, or you're not beaten up with sleet, I guess that's why this cavity is critical, but they really want a cavity, and I can only think that it has a lot to do with being wet moisture. Inside the colony is, of course, the wax that they build on. I got a question about those inserts we're all using. If we're deeply concerned about winter survival, is there any difference whatsoever, and I don't know, and I don't really think I'm gonna go check it, that we put a piece of, of insert, plastic insert in that's seven times thicker than the normal midrib that the bees use. So are they having to heat? Is that a heat barrier? I don't know, in the middle of that. Nobody look because I don't wanna go back to wiring those frames and embedding the wires and doing all that. It's just really nice to keep watching TV while you're snapping in those inserts and those cheap plastic frames that rack and let the honey leak out when you stack it to one side. But they're cheap. <laughs> so that works out very well. Propolis reinforced. I mentioned propolis in a few minutes. It deserves more than it gets. And of course, I've said this over and over again, bees don't build hexes, they build circles and the hexes naturally evolved. You can see the circles and you see the hexes there too. This propolis stuff and drones, in my opinion, those two bee issues deserve more respect than they get. I think the bees are using this stuff a lot more than we realize and it's a lot more important to them. I was surprised to find out just a few years ago they do actually store this stuff. They do lay it around inside the colony and wait for a tire puncture or whatever they need it for and they go back and pull this stuff up because they will coat that cavity to keep out other insects and to help treat it some so that they're able to caulk that winter cavity to some degree. This water thing, 
I'd like to take my entire two hours and go into it. It has driven me and my neighbors crazy. Now for you folks who've got a lake right next door to you and neighbors are 12 miles away, take a nap. I'll come back to you in just a few minutes. But because I've had to deal with the water thing over and over again, uh, I've become sensitized by it. They don't store water other than metabolic water that's somehow either contained in the honey that they'll get out when they metabolize it. Uh, I'm saying this because most of my neighbors interact because of water. And you get to know your neighbors up close and personal. And I've said in this room before to the Ohio beekeepers who were here before, it's in their eyes. When the neighbor comes and says, your bees are down in my landscape pond, they hold a good steady eye because I have offended them, my bees. So it's, a, it's an unconscious, aggressive thing. So I've been, me on the other hand, I'm just shifty eyes like me, oh wow. So are you see my bees? I'm looking along. You know, it's like a two dogs squaring off here. Who's gonna do this thing? So I'm begging for sympathy. If you folks don't have to go through this, those of us who do, it's kind of miserable. So you come up with this song and dance routine about why it's not going to be your bees. How can you prove it's my bees? <laughs> so the neighbor called, nice enough lady, said my bees are just covering her landscape pond, this was two months ago, and they can't get to, to clean it and they can't enjoy sitting around it because of these clouds of bees. Good grief. Can't be my bees. The neighbor across the street's got bees. I'll throw him under the bus. <laughs> so I went down to have a look, and those stupid bees go into this little ugly, dirty landscape pond, murky, moldy water, were just flying like a 15-lane highway, no other way, back and forth to my yard. <laughs> and all you can stand there is just use the word, oh because it is my bees. And then I said, well, I guess I gotta move them or put a screen over here. So she said, no, no, I'll just work it at night. I just thought she wanted to know. Well, I can't stop them. And they were flying right over a little kid pool I took away from my grandkids and filled it full of clean water and then got tired of cleaning it because they go to the neighbor's sewage water almost <laughs> to harvest it there. So what I want to ask then is, the other aspects of it, because I'm sensitized to water foragers now, I got to watching it. I've seen bees foraging for water when the outside ambient temperature is 40 degrees. And I've just given you all those numbers a bit ago. How can these bees physiologically be here because they're drinking at least water that's 40 degrees? So how are they warming all that little drop of water up, flying back with it, and why are so many drowning? It's a essentially about a 40 to 45 percent suicide run. Why are they so desperate for water in September? October is not blazing hot. There's not a vast amount of brood to feed, but they're crazy for it. Little to no brood. They will go to my water source when it's lightly raining, which is funny. You guys are really stupid. There's water all around you. You'd have to come here. You can drink it on the landing board, but nope, they go to where they get the water they really like. So. What I was wondering is, is there, are, are there winter water needs that we don't know about because we pull bees out of their natural tree and put them in a box? I have not a shred of anything to support that other than the only thing that shuts them down is that last possible degree of flight possibility. Does that mean that they're done with the water collecting or they just simply cannot go get it anymore? I don't have any idea. So. One of you should design a heated water hive feeder. And we put that in the same category as the Ohio beekeeper who I grew to love, but he drove me crazy, who actually grounded his beehives electrically. Every beehive had a copper rod beside him and was attached. The queen excluder was attached to the ground because he was insistent that that wood framed metal queen excluder picked up a static positive charge that would pop those negative, those uh, bees. He came back with a positive charge and that thing was grounded there. And he thought if he asked me 10,000 times, would I finally one day just produce an answer for him? So I never knew. But if you want to be sure that that uh, queen excluder is not shocking your bees unintentionally, ground that thing. 
Jesus. <laughs> and the thing is, I went to that guy's house a dozen times, and I make a picture of nothing. And you think I ever snapped a picture? What broke me was he also said he could see a difference in the different types of music that he played to the bees, that they were more gentle if he played a waltz than if he played country and western. So he preferred to play, uh, okay, I'm out of here. If the grounded beehive thing ever had a shred, you just destroyed it. The water thing hangs on me. All right, I'm gonna try it. With a computer that's not mine, Quick time not available. This is a communist computer. <laughs> I had done it right. I was not going to fall into your trap. I've got a great video to go with the other videos you couldn't see about a ridiculous number of bees that had drowned in this little wading pool that I had here. And so I did the Clara Barton thing. I'd go around and I'd scoop out these things with this sifter thing and take them back in the shop and warm them up, breathe on them. I would encourage them. I'd give them a little snack and send them back home. Well, after about 7,000 bees, <laughs> you're a dumbass, you can drown. I'm tired of this. <laughs> I'm not fishing you out anymore. You're a slow learner. But I'm leaving at that point. I don't know why they're so bonkers about this whole thing. This natural comb space, we've gotten it totally away from that. I don't know what it really means to have all these straight combs when the bees clearly want it crooked. I suspect that it has more of an air breakup. I suspect it has more of a moisture distribution procedure because it washes it and blow right out. This beehive wants ex essentially 50 to 60 percent relative humidity for those larvae to develop. Now we have to vent the hive, and I'll say more about this later, but I'll just be repeating myself. We have to vent the hive to let that extra winter moisture out and then by doing that, we're disrupting the, re the relative humidity level in the brood nest. The only way they can replace it is to get water, which they can't because it's too cold, or eat honey, which means they go through honey stores faster to generate metabolic water. Do I have a solution? No, I don't. I'm just pointing out the issue and waiting for somebody else to solve it. If the bees do their own thing, I could spend the day on this. They let, like their nest looking like this. We feel like we've done a great job when we go in and rip all this out and destroy it. Combs are connected at the top. Uh, the ventilation and humidity is, depends on the cavity they've chosen. Our value of, these, of this wall of the trees and the rocks they're in is significantly, at least meaningful, greater than our one wooden wall. I'm not blasting modern beehives. I'm just saying they're not perfect. And if we're trying to understand why bees don't survive it's like as much as we'd like to, we gotta look at everything, just not the things that we think are obvious. The old combs are essentially a, an abandoned liver. We think that all toxins come from things that we apply. Nope, there's some natural toxins out there in the hill country of Pennsylvania, in the azaleas in South Alabama. There's some plants that don't want honeybees visiting them. So bees have worked out an interesting way to bring this back and then have this absorb all that stuff. Then they move away from it. And then the insects and animals that we hate, like mice and wax moths, come in and degrade this stuff at times, and so this kind of process just keeps going over and over again. These old combs and cocoons can hold about 14% of their weight in water. So it's one of the few ways that bees have of storing moisture, enough to put that back into the colony when they need it. Colony lifespan, I don't know. Anybody here phase out combs? I date my combs so I know when to feel guilty about not phasing them out. <laughs> but otherwise, that's pretty much it, because I just can't stand to do it. I'm from the old school when combs lasted forever. But I do believe in some instances, many instances, that these things should be torn down and redone. <sighs> okay, I'll add that to the list, but I'm not sure I can get back. You, you folks who raised your hand, I think you're on the right track. Comb spacing, propolis covering, entrance is variable. This bottom ecosystem, I wish I knew more about it. There's a whole bevy of animals that live down here. And I referred to them in that picture I told you I'd come back to mentally. I don't know what they do. I don't know if they're all bad. I don't know if they have any effect at all. I don't know if that beehive and its consort of degraders down below were one big happy family and we've disrupted all of that. I have no idea if there's some kind of symbiotic relationship. I don't know because I was taught to scrape my bottom boards clean or put on screen bottom boards. So this whole thing is gone 
and unanswered. The only information I get at all is from people who take bees out of houses or occasionally out of trees. So I just will leave that out there unanswered. We don't know what that bottom ecosystem did, good or bad. We just took it out because it didn't fit our management scheme. Looks like that to the outside. So you don't see all these mysteries that go on with these bees building combs, living at the top, generating in many cases a CO2 level that's just unacceptable in the winter. And then by doing that, it basically narcosizes the bees into a stupor, which lowers their metabolic activity to low enough to let them live at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, a, a bit or two below, because they are in an oxygen-deprived atmosphere. And then as things begin to heat up, move around, then begin to fan again, they'll clear that stuff out, and everything will be all right. And there's the smallest amount of evidence that Varroa really doesn't like that high CO2 oxygen deprived atmosphere. But that's all I know. It's just one data point about that. Can't hear you. Say it again. CO2 carbon dioxide. No. Well, it does. CO2 will settle to the bottom. It's heavier, right? Yep. So, and it was, you know, as it accumulates in the bottom, it'll leak out of these natural hives. The thing I have trouble with, and I'm stumbling, because no bee tree is the same. Some are solid and nicely formed and thick insulating and whole moisture and everything looks good. It's going to be here for a while. Other trees are too small, kind of shoddy, whatever. How long have I gone, Kim? Who's, who's clocking me? Before the first half, I still got time? Okay. Please, real loud, I'm deaf as a hammer. Got hearing aids in both ears and doesn't help. Yes, sir. What do you think of the guys that are trying out those eco floors? Eco floors? You see, this is the kind of thing in my life that I've just grown to hate. <laughs> I used to know more than anybody in the room about bees. <laughs> <laughs> and now you guys have that damnable web, and you come in, and I just hate it when you say, Have you read on the web? No, I haven't read that. There's 42,000 web pages, and I haven't seen it. I need to stand up real loud, speak to the whole group. If you want me to, I'll bring you the microphone. Uh, I've seen on Facebook bee groups, some guys are making uh, basically an empty stupor, and they'll put a screen so bees can't get in there, but then they'll fill that empty stupor with wood chips, uh, tree branches, or whatnot, and just leave it alone. And the guys, of course, they see all kinds of little critters in there, see little scorpions, uh, all kinds of things. Right. Um, I know I have not done that myself. I didn't know they were doing it on Facebook. Yeah. The longest I've seen somebody trying is two years. And of course, they're going to make great claims. You know, they'll say uh, certain insects are going to eat their own legs or whatever debris falls down there. Um, but as far as I know, it's only being tried by certain people. So well, I like it. I don't know. If I want to say 10 times, I have no idea if that bottom ecosystem is of any consequence or not. We're clear on that, right? You're going to get hit sooner or later. I'll move over. I have no idea. I'm putting it out there because I can't find anything about it, anyone who knows anything about it. It could just be a complete waste of time. And besides that, who's going to want to put trash in the bottom of their hive? So it may be a moot point anyway. I just don't know what it does since we're trying to look under every rock there is to keep our bees as healthy as possible. They want about a one foot cubic cavity when they pass the winter. They want it dry. They want a defendable entrance, nothing else living there. And they don't want it at ground level. This ground level thing was your idea and it wasn't a good one. <laughs> because when a bee comes out with a fallen comrade and she's going to clean hive, well just imagine if she's at least this high carrying her own body weight, she's going to have a steep drop, and then she'll finally get airborne under heavy, heavy load, and then fly away out of sight and jettison that bee somewhere else. Well, because you want the nest close to the ground, she comes outside, she scratches and yawns and gears up, brings up all her body temperatures, grabs her dead comrade, and crashes right into the ground. And then she's stuck there, because she certainly can't get airborne at that point. So if you can, at least go 18 inches, and that would still allow uh, space for, a, I think you said a shallow. 
but the pallets of the world are going to be right on the ground. But not a big deal because you're going to load them up and be gone anyway, and the bees you're working with, they transition every, what, three weeks or so, so commercial guys wouldn't really deal with that because they, those bees are going to be moving on, moving out, or being phased out anyway. Hackenberg said nobody wants to rent old bees, so he doesn't mind leaving field forces and whatever because he wants to rent fresh bees. I'm quoting Hackenberg. That could be totally wrong. It's a Hackingbirdianism. <laughs> you see you say that. <laughs> Not at ground level. So this apiary this looks good to me. Up beside Interstate 71, down around Mansfield, Ohio, by an old master beekeeper, long gone. And I wonder, just while we're talking, what happens to hives like that that we properly lean to the front? If we agree that bees need these combs to orient with gravity, what happens when we come along and lean them up and throw that thing off three or four degrees? Did the, did the larvae still lay straight or they have to lay up on one side? I have no idea, but we think and we recommend that you tilt all these bottom boards and then throw the brood nest off axis two to three degrees so the water will drain out. So here we got perfectly normal bee yard. It's really nice because you can feed skunks here in front of all of them. <laughs> Uh, it's really nice because this bee can rob that one really readily and not even know about it. And this one can have an American fowl brood and scatter it to all the others, and that way you keep all your American fowl brood right in one area here. <laughs> so you can tell we've got a lot of thought put in this thing. So this is about as natural as something that would look like this. The bees of the world have never seen this kind of configuration where we stack them side by side. But I was really intrigued with Andy or you who said one beekeeper had 26 colonies and 26 locations? Well, that's funny, but if you're an enthusiast, you can do it, and then you can point everybody else to be wrong. If you're a commercial guy, you're gonna lose your shirt. If you're 67 year old, like I am, you're gonna have one or two colonies in good shape and 24 that are near death, I can tell you that. <laughs> so it's not common, so we've gone from something that looks about like this to something that's really nice and neat and organized. And we've done this so long until it looks normal. It looks natural. I mean, your grandfather and mother was doing this. How could it be wrong? Well, the thing is, you never took the bees vote. And here's the other deal. We've taken out so many cavities, locations are not welcome in the wall of your house, so they'll do reasonably well inside this box because they're very adaptable anyway, but it may not just be as perfect for them as you might think, but who in the world wants to go back to something like this or slides that I've got coming up right now? Let's just manage this. Want to come right? This is not my hive. <laughs> Yeah, it's not mine. Is there a brand anywhere here? No brand from the frames? I can tell you what happened here, though. That's where the free pound cage went. And somebody, I don't want to call any names, but his initials are Jim, was going to come back and fill that in. But I love this picture. I've got 40,000 slides, and a book publishing company just told me that I had 40,000 photographic pieces of junk because they weren't publishable in that format. So. One of my top five favorite pictures because these bees do not give up. We may have been doing this now since 1900, but if you give them their way, they still know exactly their way to do it. So are they hard-headedly stupid or is this just not well designed for them? I'll leave that with a pregnant pause. <coughs> There's no place to put this. I didn't take the winter drone thing seriously. I was told from the early, late 60s, early 70s, all the drones were killed in the fall and that's the end of it. I didn't go looking for them. I didn't crack the propolis seal and bother bees in the winter because they'll freeze to death and die in South Alabama. And so I began to hear eight or nine or 10 years ago about drones in the winter. Well, I just thought the beekeepers that, you know, I don't know, doing something or whatever, they couldn't really <laughs> tell drones. So I didn't want to stress them on, oh, sure, if you saw drones, that's all right. <laughs> Until I saw that one, and I wasn't doing anything odd, and that thing was alive on February the 23rd, 
which means it had a birthday of January the 31st in Worcester, Ohio, 26 miles down the road. So is it an artifact? If you've seen winter drones, show me your hand. So you folks in the middle don't work your bees very much, or what? <laughs> Because that was odd. Everybody over there, everybody over here, nobody here. <laughs> Did you come on the same bus? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea why they're doing that. You have an idea. I think they're raised in the winter, though. I, think they over, I don't think they're actually raised in the winter. I think they overwinter with the cluster. I can't argue that at all. I have no idea why they're there. Thinks they're raised early on and just have lived that long. Colony was queen right, to my knowledge, I didn't rip into it. But she was just there, and I photographed her. Any other comments on winter drones? Real loud. Go. Can you all hear? She basically just took our mystery away from us and made it mundane. <laughs> no, it's an Italian function where she's raising drones for the next season already. So anyway, there's drones there for whatever reason, and it's destroyed one of my little deals that I've always taught. A colony surviving in perpetuity is our idea. So the way the bees run their lives, run their winters, and the colonies they select and choose looks like what I've just tried to describe to the best of my very paltry ability. This is not easy to do because I'm having to fill in the blanks for you, and that's kind of a reckless thing to do. So the remnants of their migratory behavior, I don't know. Uh, they just cast a lot of swarms and hope some survive. They never depend on one resource ever. That's why they drive me crazy about the water. I can never tell my neighbors, oh, they just finally, oh, finally learn mine. They'll get, no, they won't. They want to know where every water source is in their foraging community, so they always know where some water is. Uh, they've resisted our domestication. I had a picture that just showed you that. They're just basically tenants. If we were any farther south in Central America, South America, you'd see these bees just hop skipping along with the flow. They'd leave that nest there and be gone. 